Um, I'd just like to explain the Easter Vigil Liturgy at this time. Uh, once I invited my scuba instructor to Midnight Mass, and then he instructed me for four certifications. However, he was totally lost during the Mass. So, first I'd like to explain the Restored Holy Week Liturgy. A small number of traditional Catholic bishops and priests reject the Holy Week Liturgy, restored to its original time. Um, and then the Easter, for example, the Easter Vigil was before 1955, it was set in the morning, and then the Lenten fast would end at noon, and the bells would ring, but Christ is still in the tomb. So um, the Holy Father brought it back to the original time. And I remember speaking to Father Fred Schell, a Jesuit, who has been a priest for over 50 years, and then I asked him about what he's thought about the new Holy Week liturgy, and he in other words, the restored Holy Week liturgy of 1955, and he just looked puzzled. In other words, the Holy Father uh, approved it, so uh, he's infallible. So the Pope has spoken, the matter is finished. So Pope Pius XII fulfilled his duties to us, but um, when we reject that, then we destroy obedience to the Pope and destroy papal authority. So it's something totally objective. In other words, I get to make a judgment because I'm perturbed by what the true Pope said. And older is not always better. So they falsely claimed that it was an introduction to the new Mass. But that's false, and they blame Bonini. But Bonini was only an under-secretary of the Sacred Congregation of Rights. In other words, he had very, very little power at all. And it... Those, the others in the Sacred Congregation Rites were traditional Catholics. So it becomes disobedience based on personal whims, personal preference. They don't use it because it doesn't suit their preference. Everybody gets to choose their own. So just real quickly in summary, the changes were certainly made by the Pope, Pope Pius XII, 1955. He cannot prom promulgate a liturgy that's harmful to the church because he's infallible in those matters. And then he forbade the use of the previous Holy Week liturgy and he obliged the clergy to use the restored liturgy. And then he restored the fast. It had been a four, uh, 39 and a half days. The fa Lenten fast ended at noon on Holy Saturday before but then he restored it to the 40 days, just as Jesus had fasted for 40 days. And the bottom line, he, there's very minor changes he made, but in the Easter Vigil's um, liturgy, he made it like between an hour and an hour and a half, or even two hours shorter. So th that's not a bad thing. So the Easter... Vigil liturgy has nine parts, and I'd like to explain that so you can get the most out of it, and then f follow along in your papers with the prayers, please. So first is the blessing of the fire, and that will be outside. The ceremony is beginning the evening about 10.30 p.m. outside the church with the lighting of the Paschal fire and the blessing and lighting of the Paschal candle. So that's that very large candle that's blessed. This has a twofold significance. First, the presence of God in the pillar of fire that guided the Israelites in the desert. And also, it's a symbol of Christ, the light of the world, whose life and teachings dispel the spiritual darkness in which mankind was living. The splendor of the risen Christ is symbolized by the blazing light of the fire. Second is the blessing of the fire and the, I mean, the Pasch blessing of the Paschal candle. The large candle represents our Lord who said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me does not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Lighted from the new Easter fire and blessed, the Paschal candle will remain in the sanctuary for 40 days until Ascension Thursday. The candle is decorated with five grains of incense. They look 
similar to uh, th their wax nails made of their red color to signify the five wounds of Christ. In blessing this candle, the priest carves the sign of the cross into it, saying, Christ, yesterday and today, the beginning and the end. And then the third part is the procession and the exultant. The priest carries the Paschal candle in procession into the church, and it'll be darkened. As you know, the lights are out, so that's the only light that we see. And thrice announces Lumen Christi, the light of Christ. He'll sing it. And then after each introduction, the, uh, you, uh, then you just join in, uh, Deo gratias, thanks be to God. And then the candles are lit. If we had clergy, they would be by the clergy, and then by the servers, and then by the laity. But first I'll do it to w the one server, and then to the rest of the servers, and then lastly to the ushers. And then they'll light your candles. This symbolizes how Christ, the light of the world, first illuminated the apostles and disciples, and from them the rest of the world. When the procession has entered the sanctuary, the priest places a Paschal candle in its holder and chants one of the most beautiful chants of the entire liturgy, the Exultant. So please follow along in your prayer book. You'll be holding your candle. The servers that are free will be holding a candle, and then we'll, I'll be singing the beautiful prayer. Then the priest continues to chant the praises of our Redeemer in the splendor of a glorious preface, which recalls the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve, and the infinite love of God to send his only begotten Son who shed his blood for our redemption. This pre preface manifests a beautiful relationship between the sacrifice of the Paschal Lamb and the Old Testament, whose blood was placed on the doorpost of the Israelites on the day of their deliverance from slavery to the Egyptians, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, which he shed for our redemption. The fourth part is the four lessons. Again, before the changes of Pius XII, there were 12 lessons. So it's probably like another hour longer, similar to, close to that. Then there's a reading of the lessons in which we read the account of the creation of the world and of man, the crossing of the Red Sea by the Israelites, and their journey to the promised land. And then I'll stand up and, uh, uh, I mean, I'm standing reading the lessons in the center of the sanctuary. And then I'll say, O Ramos, and then you stand up. And then I'll genuflect, and I'll say, uh, let's uh, kneel or genuflect, uh, flectamus genua, and then I sing levate just by myself. Levate means stand up. Okay. Okay, and then part five is the chanting, the first part of the Litany of the Saints. So I'm sure you've prayed the Litany of the Saints before. In the old um, pre-1955 Holy Week, they would uh, double it. So it would say, Lord have mercy on us, Lord have mercy on us, Christ have mercy on us, Christ have mercy on us. Sometimes that's done in processions. The church requires that. But then the, the Holy Father just said, we'll just say it once. And that, again, that shortens it too. Um, after the completion of the Latins, the Litany of the Saints has begun, in which we invoke the intercession of all the heavenly court of angels and saints. Okay, and then six, um, I'll bless the Easter water and the baptismal water, and then very quickly explain that. Easter water, it's blessed in the sight of the people to indicate that it's very powerful, blessed water. It weakens and burns demons. It's much more powerful than only ordinary holy water. And that's been confirmed many times during exorcisms. And I've seen it over and over again. I ran out of the um, Easter water and then I had to bless some other holy water. I says, oh, this isn't as powerful as that other stuff. And then um, with the Easter water, you'll see me do some things over there. First, I'll uh, one time I'll divide the water in the form of a cross, and I call upon the Holy Ghost to take possession of it. And then three times I breathe upon the water in the form of the cross and say, bless this clear water with thy breath, O Lord, that not only will it cleanse men's bodies by its usual power, but also may cleanse men's souls. And then 
the, the large candle, the Paschal candle, is lowered into the water three times as I sing a prayer. And the reason I did, we have it in a large container so it's sufficient for everybody and then also for exorcisms. Um, a few years ago, um, there would be some exorcisms after Easter and then the demons know how powerful it is. So um, Good Friday after the liturgy, um, someone filled that up and then they came, the servers came on Holy Saturday and it was flipped over by itself. And, um, and it, so we had an experiment. We did, did it all over again another day and nothing happened. So they just don't like Easter water. Another time, uh, the year before, we used the same container we used, used the year before. It was watertight when it was filled. But then when it was used again, it, it leaked. So we had to get another container before we blessed it. And then with the baptismal water, I'd just like to show you So um, some water from the blessed Easter water will be placed into here. And then this will be used for baptisms. But besides the other prayers that were said, then there's certain prayers that are used. And then I'll use, uh, this has the oil of catechumens and then also the holy chrism. So I pour a little bit of one oil and then of the other oil and then I use both. And then um, afterwards, I mix it with my hand. And then I'll put just a little bit into this small container. I will put incense in over here. And then we'll have a short procession to the baptismal font. So some of the newly blessed Easter waters placed in a separate container. Prayers are recited and two holy oils are added. This water is used for baptisms. Baptismal water is given the spiritual power to give a sharing in the life of God, sanctifying grace and the removal of original sin. Then there's a short procession and then the incensation of the baptismal font. After the tabernacle, the baptismal font is the most sacred thing in the church. Okay, we're almost finished. The renewal of baptismal promises. As Christ rose from the dead, so it's fitting that we rise again from our sins. We renew the promises of our baptism. Uh, for most of us, it was our godparents that answered for us. If we were converts or uh, were baptized later in life, then... Uh, we did it ourselves, but here we renew it. All of us do that. This was not in the pre-1955 Easter Vigil. We renew the promises of baptism to renounce Satan, his pomps. His pomps are the spirit of the world, and then his works are the occasions of sin. So we renounce Satan, his pomps, and his works. We pledge our loyalty to Christ and his church. And then part eight, it's the second part of the Litany of the Saints. The choir will sing that. Well, we get the altar ready for, for Mass to begin. And then finally is the Easter Midnight Mass. Because of the preceding ceremonies, the Mass is shortened. The prayers of the foot of the altar, the creed, the offertory verse, the communion verse, the Agnus Dei, and the last gospel are omitted. The sudden change within the church at the Gloria announces the glorious resurrection of Christ 
from the dead. So the reason I wanted to explain this is uh, you may have seen this before. The, you've been to the Easter Vigil. I hope all Catholics come and take part in the Easter Vigil. It's the most beautiful liturgy of the church year. Um, but let, now you understand a little bit about what this is and what that is and why we do this and why we do that. So uh, if you could uh, go outside now, and then the ushers will give you candles, and then the servers will go outside, and then we'll begin. <laughs> 